With that in mind, when Wisconsin became a state in 1848, its constitution was specifically written to prohibit the use of state monies or credit to finance railroads projects. So, Dalrymple, William Dalrymple. I was able to trace his family uh, back seven generations to a Scottish nobleman, Sir James, I could do this, this spell right here, Sir James Dalrymple, the first Viscount of Stair. William and his siblings were fifth generation Americans. Their great great grandfather, having immigrated from Scotland to the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1711. William was born on April 17, 1825, one of nine children, eight boys and a girl. <coughs> the family lived on a farm located in Sugar Grove, which is right up there in Sugar Grove. Of the eight sons, all but two of them would remain in Sugar Grove where they came, became very successful farmers. The two exceptions were William and his younger brother, Oliver. These two boys started their careers as teachers, uh, actually when they were uh, teenagers. William taught school until 1848, at which time he entered into a brief partnership at a general store and a sawmill and he began acquiring land and when oil was discovered in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859, Titusville would have been right about there. He was able to lease his land for oil exploration. In 1860, he was elected to the district school superintendent and that job he held until 1866. In the meantime, this is Oliver, his brother Oliver had graduated from Yale Law School and moved to St. Peter, Minnesota to practice law as a field adjuster. In 1859, Oliver joined a St. Paul law firm. Uh, you remember your history, the Dakota and the Sioux uprising in Minnesota occurred over a period of about five weeks in 1862. This uprising resulted in the deaths of 358 settlers. Oliver's law firm handled the legal damage claims of the surviving white settlers, and Oliver was assigned to negotiate a settlement with the federal government. By act of Congress, his clients were awarded a total of $1 million, and his fee came to $40,000. This was a tight sum in those days. If you have ever done a calculation, $1 in 1862 is equivalent to about $30 today. So. Um, his, Oliver's fee would have come to about $1.2 million today. He took all of the money and bought 2,600 uh, acres of farmland in Dakota County, Minnesota. And he soon became a very successful wheat farmer. Oliver was soon writing to his brother William to induce him to visit Minnesota and make the state his home. William accepted this invitation and made his first trip to St. Paul in the fall of 1863. He was 38 years old, traveling most of the way by train. Perhaps he met Henry Rice during his visit to St. Paul, or perhaps he had already heard about Bayfield during, uh, through some of the East Coast trade newspapers, magazines that were available in the time. I don't know, but what the documents do show is that William started inquiring about property on the Bayfield Peninsula as early as 1864, enlisting the help of Andrew Tate. The first recording of his investment in Bayfield was his purchase of 160 acres of old, uh, land from old K. Paul, Tate's father-in-law, in October of 1867. Tate also helped William buy some land at Royce Point and we have a lot of people here at Royce, from Royce Point, um, from a man named Charles Brissett. Tate would continue to oversee William's uh, Bayfield property for the next several years, making sure that no one was cutting timber and that taxes were paid. <coughs> William's uh, real estate investments in Warren County were beginning to, clear, uh, to pay off. He was leasing and selling farmland. He owned a stone quarry and timberland and he was receiving royalty income from his oil wells. In short, he was doing very well financially, and he was able to extend his real estate interests in the West. 
1878, he would own a total of 400 acres of timberland on the Bayfield Peninsula, as well as city lots in Milwaukee and farmland in the Dakota Territory, which brings me back to his brother, Oliver. Oliver had farmed successfully in Minnesota uh, for several years, but in 1872, his crops were eaten by grasshoppers and his investment in the grain futures was lost during the financial panic of 1873. Ironically, Oliver was saved from ruin by one of the leading causes of the panic, the bankruptcy of the Northern Pacific Railroad. You will recall that the, from your high school classes, that the Northern Pacific was designed to be a transcontinental railroad. The company was given almost 60 million acres of land grants by the federal government in the Dakota territories to finance the construction of the railroad. But the cost was exceeding expectation. In 1879, in 1870, excuse me, a man named Jay Cook, uh, Cook stepped in. Cook's plan was to make Duluth the shipping connection between the Pacific Coast and the Great Lakes. And for the next three years, he threw his company's money and his own into the construction project. Unfortunately, he had little success marketing the land in the Dakota Territory and he overextended his company's resources. Cook and company went bankrupt and the Northern Pacific went into receivership. Several of the railroad's largest investors opted to trade their Northern Pacific bonds for large tracts of land. Together, these five men would ultimately acquire almost 120,000 acres of land in the Dakota Territory. And since they were bankers and not farmers, Guess who they turned to? William or Oliver Dalrymple, the Minnesota Wheat King, to develop what would become a massive wheat farm operation known as the Dalrymple Bonanza Farms. The contract that Oliver had with these investors gave him a share of the profits and the option to gradually acquire ownership of the farms. He immediately began to exercise his option with the financial assistance of his brother, William. William and other members of the Dalrymple family soon owned or helped to manage about 100,000 acres of land. So just to give you an idea, at that time the average size of a farm in the Dakotas was 200 to 300 acres. With the success of the Dakota farms came the corresponding need to transport the wheat to the markets in Minneapolis, Chicago, and the East Coast. The Dalrymple boys decided they should develop transportation connection with their farms to the railroad lines that were already in existence or those that were in the works. Oliver was interested in developing port facilities in Duluth, just like Jay Cook. William, however, wanted uh, to bypass Duluth in favor of Milwaukee on Lake Michigan or Bayfield on Lake Superior, towns where he already owned a significant amount of property. Oliver reluctantly agreed. William's original plan was to build a railroad out of Milwaukee, which would have been a good option for the brothers. The city already had a railroad connection and was becoming a major transportation center. But building the railroad in the late 1870s, early 1880s, was not an insignificant undertaking. He needed money and a lot of it. Most of the potential railroad investors were located on the East Coast and, believe it or not, in Europe. And there was a lot of competing railroad companies attempting to attract interest in their own projects. In 1878, William acquired control of an existing railroad company in Milwaukee and began soliciting financing to construct the line. But despite years of planning, he was never able to make a go of it. In the meantime, plans were in the works for the Chicago St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Omaha Railway to be constructed from Bay Hudson to Bayfield. As you know, those plans changed and instead the Omaha was built to Ashland, arriving there in 1880. Bayfield would have to wait another three years before the Omaha built its branch line to Washburn and ultimately to Bayfield. The arrival of the Omaha led to a boom town, a time for the town of Bayfield. The streets were still dirt, cows and other livestock were still wandering around the town, 
but within a couple of years, the population almost tripled and the village began to prosper. William was still working on his, excuse me, his Milwaukee project, but switched his focus <coughs> to Bayfield. In early 1883, before the Omaha had even arrived in Bayfield, William had incorporated two companies, the Bayfield Improvement Company and the Bayfield Transport Railway Company. The stated purpose of these two companies was to acquire land and riparian rights along Lake Superior and to construct and operate docks, warehouses, and railroad lines within Bayfield and Ashland counties. In short, Dalrymple's plan was to turn Bayfield into a major port city, if not the major port, on Lake Superior, providing cheap transportation of wheat from the Dakotas to Bayfield, where it would be transferred onto ships to the East Coast or trains to the Twin Cities in Chicago. I don't know how extensive his original plan was, but by 1852, this was his concept. His harbor system would be comprised of a solid line of docks and warehouses. Oh, the woman here. Be serviced by a transfer railroad that would run from Washington County, or Washington Avenue, all the way along the shoreline and out to uh, past Royce Point and out into Red, uh, Red Cliff. He also had a plan to have a Bayfield, a main, a main line, the Bayfield Air, excuse me, Bayfield Harbor and Great Western, which was going to run from here, about here, up through the peninsula, and then around and down towards Iron River. Iron River was a transportation railroad, a transportation hub at that time, unbelievable. His plans must have thrilled the Bayfielders. They saw their hopes for the future finally coming to fruition. I mean, just look at what the railroad company, the railroad connection would do for Duluth. In this bird's eye view of Duluth Harbor from 1887, and for Ashland, this one, bird's eye view in 1890 of its harbor. See how extensive that all was. William wasted no time getting started. Beginning in early 1883, his company bought and rebuilt the old long dock at the foot of Washington Avenue, all of the waterfront property between Bayfield and Redcliffe. He began negotiating with members of the Red Cliff tribe to purchase a right of way across the reservation, and he filed a petition with the Department of Interior for approval of that right of way. He also began to negotiate with the Omaha managers to construct a connecting line from its proposed terminus on Penny Headed, Penny, Mini Penny Avenue, to the start of the transfer line on Washington Avenue. Despite this early start, Dalrymple's Railroad would not begin to operate until April 1898, 15 years after its incorporation. So what happened? I quoted, I did this booklet, which is online. If you want to look at it, you can get it through the VHA. And I quoted extensively from the original ledger entries and letters in the booklet that I wrote. Um, which you can access online, but the bottom line comes down to a combination of three things. Money, roadblocks, and health. Money. The classic funding for railroads in the 1880s had involved land grants, private investments, municipal bonds. The land grants were not available in Wisconsin because of their constitution, and while communities were allowed to support railroad construction through the issuance of municipal bonds, these bonds were essentially commitments to revive funding once the railroad was in operation. So Dalrymple had to find outside investors to get the startup capital necessary to pay his crew, build the road, and purchase the equipment. In 1885, he filed articles of incorporation for his main line railroad line, the Bayfield Care Harbor and Great Western. And corporate bonds were issued to raise funds for its construction. <coughs> From 1885 to 1891, he worked hard to find investors, mainly in the East Coast and again in Europe, but to no avail. And he was not able to meet the various deadlines set by Bayfield to complete sections of the road to get the municipal funding. 
By January 1891, William, now 66 years old, was openly and wondering if he would ever be able to make his Bayfield Rig Railroad project a success, especially in light of the head start that Ashland, Duluth, and even Washburn were enjoying. But despite his concerns, he continued with his plans. He established a permanent office in Bayfield, hired a distant relative, Herbert Hale, to manage his business interests, hired Edward Hollage to begin surveying and mapping out the routes to be taken to his, by his two railroads, and he obtained final approval for the right of way he needed for the transfer across Red Cliff. He also began spending more, time, more of his time during the summer months in Bayfield, typically staying at the Island Field Hotel. One factor that he no doubt took into consideration at this time was the rumor in 1891 that the federal government was planning to improve the canal system between the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway by deepening the can uh, canal to 21 feet. This proposal would have significantly improved the shipping options that are available to Bayfield by enabling larger freighters to navigate between into the Great Lakes. Dalrymple was actually appointed by Bayfield to represent it as a delegate to the Deep Water Conventions, and he would attend the annual conventions over the next few years until his health failed him. As it turned out, the canal would not be opened to large deep draft vessels for much later, a delay that Herbert Hale would later blame for the ultimate failure of Dalrymple's railroad. The right-of-way across the reservation for the Bayfield transfer was approved in 1891, and grading for the transfer from Washington Avenue north to Redwood was done in 1892 and 1893. It was finally ready to start construction of the main road uh, toward Iron River, but it was now clear that no major work would be done as a result of the financial panic of 1893 and the four-year depression that followed. During the same time period, from 1885 to 1893, Dalrymple also ran into some roadblocks put up by a surprising source, Robinson D. Pike. Pike was all in favor of Dalrymple's railroad, but, and here I'm reading between the lines, <laughs> apparently he could care less about turning Bayfield into a transportation center. He was much more interested in having a railroad system. There he is that would give him greater access to the vast timberland that he owned on the peninsula. Over the years, starting in 1885, Pike attempted to either get control of Dalrymple's railway company or build a competing railroad. His first move was to try to get himself a couple, and a couple of his fellow lumbermen on the board of directors of the BH and GW company, which would have given Pike control of the company's operations. Dalrymple uh, politely declined this suggestion. He then raised, Pike then raised, a series of roadblocks over the next 12 years. For instance, in May of 1888, he announced that he was forming a new railroad company to run a line out of Bayfield and Washburn, which would have competed with Dalrymple's main line to Iron River. It does not appear that he took any further steps at this time, but the possibility of another railroad probably affected William's ability to obtain necessary funding for his own. Yes. R.D. Pike was also encouraged by the news that came three years later in 1891 that the federal government was planning to enlarge the canals. But rather than support Dalrymple's efforts, he began to take steps in his own interest. Now it really became interesting. In 1892, when survey work for the BH and GW line was begun, Pike volunteered to collect the subscription monies pledged by individuals like William Knight and Isaac Wing so that Hale could pay the survey crew. At first, Pike simply failed to collect the subscriptions despite repeated requests from Hale and despite the subscribers offering to pay. Pike then, and again I'm reading between the lines, what, had, what he thought, no doubt, was a clever idea. He collected just enough money to cover the cost of the survey work that had already been done. He then told Hale that this money meant he was entitled to get possession of the survey documents which he and his cronies had paid for. 
When that didn't work, Pike and two other men, William Knight and A.J. Muscle, simply marched into the surveyor's office and took the field books by force. He then announced that the formation of another new railroad company, the Bayfield, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad, and spread a rumor that Dalrymple was not intending to finish his own BH and GW Railroad. He bade Pike again using the field notes that he had stolen, borrowed, borrowed, whatever, <laughs> um, and that he had taken, and he started to survey a line for his proposed state railroad, which would run, surprise, surprise, parallel to the Bay, to the Bayfield Harbor and GW line. Dalrymple had to bring a replevin action to recover the survey books and threaten to have Pike charged with the trespass that he attempted to grade next to or over the BH and GW line. Then it becomes even more complicated. And now I already mentioned this, but in order to obtain a right of way through Redcliffe, Dalrymple had to get the approval of the Department of Interior and the President of the United States. He had obtained that approval for the transfer in 1891, but now he needed approval for his second right of way for the main line to Iron River. What to Pike II? He filed a competing application for a comparable right of way for his proposed railroad. On June 25, 1892, the law firm that was representing Dalrymple at the Department of Interior wrote, quote, we immediately began an investigation and discovered that the Bayfield, Lakeshore, and Western Pikes Railway Company had filed a map of definite location almost identical with the Bayfield Harbor and Great Western Dalrymple's company, and that they had secured a large number of deeds from the Indians. This was the cause of the suspension of operations to obtain final approval for the right of way for Dalrymple. And it seemed plain to us that these parties had secured the cooperation and support of the Indian agent, Agent Leahy, who, surprise, surprise, Pike had placed on his board of directors. <laughs> we at once entered a vigorous protest and showed that they had proceeded unlawfully and improperly and in violation of the old and fixed policy and practice of the department. So we don't think they will find themselves in very good order for any further favors, unquote. As it turned out, Pike had never applied for permission from the Department of Interior to even enter the re reservation or to locate his railroad, railroad lines across the reservation or to contract with Indian landowners, and further, that he had falsely claimed that Dalrymple was one of his largest subscribers to his railroad. Dalrymple got the federal approval in July, but by this time, the financing he had lined up for the VH and GW had been withdrawn. <clears throat> Some form of agreement must have been reached between Dalrymple and Pike because the Dalrymple purchased the stock and franchises of Pike's railroad company for $3,000 and became its president, planning to merge Pike's railroad company with his own, probably in an effort to obtain the $50,000 bonds that the city had previously authorized for Pike. These bonds were due to expire in April 1894, so Dalrymple needed to obtain an extension of the deadline. Rather than lend his support to the extension request, Pike showed up at the town meeting and suggested that the city require Dalrymple to furnish a $10,000 forfeiture bond as a condition of the extension should he fail to meet the deadline. Needless to say, Dalrymple was not interested in having to post such a bond, and the requirement was removed. In any event, due to the depression by the panic of 1893, Dalrymple was not able to meet the completion and lost the $50,000 bond. Mm -hmm. In 1895, Pike's not finished yet. In 1895, Pike's last move was to team up with a man named, named Dwight Saban, uh, the Stillwater st uh, senator from Stillwater, Minnesota, and incorporated yet another new railroad, the Washburn, Bayfield, and Iron River Railroad. The Bayfield County bought, voted to bond that company for $240,000. This is a lot of money. <laughs> people to build a road from Washburn to Iron River. And then the company, the county voted another bond issue the next year for $50,000 to build a spur line 
uh, to connect with Bella Rimples, BH, and GW at Racket Creek, which is a tributary to, uh, I think, the Sand River. Unfortunately, by 1898, the Pike Saban Railroad Company went bankrupt and never completed the Bayfield branch connection. The Northern Pacific, now back in its feet, bought the company for $125,000 and took over the line from Washburn into River, Iron River. The Bayfield County was stuck with the remaining debt on its bond. By this time, William was in his 70s and in very poor health. He had begun to feel ill in 1893, but a sharp decline in his health started in mid-May 1895. He would spend the next several years conducting all of his business from various hospitals in St. Paul and at the Pinoy uh, Sanatorium in Kenosha, Wisconsin. While he was very concerned about his health and even bedridden while he continued to work, he had uh, Herbert Hale and Silas Bowerville, William's uh, nephew, handle all of the on-site work of constructing the railroad, uh, the transfer railroad. In the summer of 1896, four miles of track for the transfer was laid from Washington Avenue to Redcliffe at Bowerville's personal expense. By October of 1897, Dalrymple had personally paid for and completed a total of seven miles of track, including the section of the BH and GW road. Dalrymple had previously made an effort to obtain a right-of-way for connecting the tracks from the Omaha Depot to Washington Avenue along First Street, uh, but that proposal had apparently been rejected by the town or by the landowners. In 1898, the Omaha completed the connection from its depot on Minnipenny Avenue to Washington Avenue on a trestle, which extended well out into the bay. You can, and here's the trestle, right? I'm going to go along here. It had taken 15 years, but the transfer railway finally began running out to Red Cliff in April of 1898, and it was finally making some money. As a result of the completion of the railroad, Three sawmills and a box factory would eventually be built at Royce Point and at Redcliffe. And with these three industries, two communities would be developed, one at Royce Point with 35 homes and a boarding house, and the other at Redcliffe with new homes, a boarding house, and where 15 to 18 families built homes on what's called Street Hill. We're not done yet. The last glitch, there will be one more glitch to what Galbraith's plans. Back with White. In April 1899, White Saban organized yet another railroad company called the Bayfield Western Railroad with the stated goal of completing the old Bayfield branch from the railroad that, that they had previously built from Washburn to Iron River, now owned by the Northern Pacific, north up to Red by Racket Creek. Al Rimmel was, at this point, very in favor of this new enterprise, as it would have connected his, his road to the Iron River hub. Saban, and maybe if, many of you will remember this story, but Saban had until midnight on November 30th, 1899, to complete the six miles in order to collect the bond. But the company ran into opposition from the town, townspeople, who didn't like Saban and didn't trust him which famously culminated in the slowdown during construction of the bridge at Racket Creek. Remember, they, tele they cut the telephone uh, telegraph lines, they uh, weren't paid in a timely manner, someone greased the rails, so the last parallel of rails was delayed, and, oh, which I love, barrels of whiskey were set out to get to the crew drunk. <laughs> <laughs> the company was unable to complete the bridge by the midnight deadline and lost the bond. Here's, here's a picture, I believe, of the racket bridge. Sagan's company went bankrupt almost immediately. The bridge over Racket Creek was as far as the BH and GW Railroad could ever reach. I'm going to show you. So by now, but now this is 1912, but now we have the Omaha coming from Ashland all the way up the Bayfield, the transfer going up to Redcliffe, the VH and GW coming around here to Racket Creek, 
and then down here from Washburn all the way to Iron River is the Northern Pacific. That's what we have. The connection, this I think about here was where the Bayfield Junction was supposed to be and the road was supposed to go up to here. But obviously that didn't work. Bayfield, or, I'm sorry, Bill Ripple's last trip to Bayfield was from September to December of 1899, during which time he uh, negotiated an agreement with William Knight for the sawmill Knight wanted to build at Boyce Point. Bill Ripple returned to his brother-in-law's home in Pennsylvania, where he died in mid-July 1901, probably of tuberculosis and a blood clot that had developed in his brain. He was 76 years old. Prior to his death, William had amassed an estate that included controlling interests in several railroad companies and a significant amount of real estate in Sugar Grove, Pennsylvania, in North Dakota, in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, Bayfield, and Ashland, in Duluth and St. Paul, Minnesota, and in Canada. A lifelong bachelor, William <coughs> left his estate to be divided among his brothers and their families to be distributed 10 years after his death. 10 years. He also bequeathed $500 to the Presbyterian Church in Bayfield for the purpose of completing the church building, as well as money for a public library. His will names three individuals, Herbert Hale, as, uh, including Herbert Hale, as trustees to serve for a period of up to a maximum of 20 years with directions to complete the construction and operation of the two railroads and, of course, the establishment of this planted town, uh, Dalrymple, from Division Street in Bayfield, Reset Road. From 1901 to 1919, Hale served as the operating manager of the 15 miles of track that had already been built or leased by the Bayfield Transfer <coughs> Company. In addition, he completed the lease of land at Boyce Point to William Knight with his sawmill and negotiated the lease of land at Lord's Point for the first Downey Box and Lumber Company. The old docks at Bayfield, a pre existing lumber dock at Boyce Point, and the docks that were built by the two sawmill companies at Boyce Point and the dock for the mill at Redcliffe were the only docks completed of the 50 plus piers on Dalrymple's um, original plan. You can already see if you get a, have a vote, you can see some of the dock cribs at Royce Point that, uh, from, left over from the uh, sawmills. They're still visible. I mean, they're, they look just like the, like the cribs that we put in today. The trustees considered a plan to extend the transfer track along the shoreline to Cornucopia, Port Wayne, Herbster, and ultimately Superior. And almost three miles of track were laid, but never used. Nothing was done to develop the town flat, and the flat was ultimately vacated. In 1903, Andrew Carnegie donated money to Bayfield for the public library. With a stipulation that the town would provide the land. The land on which the library was built was donated by the Dalrymple estate. At some point in time, land also owned by Dalrymple was either forfeited for taxes or donated and used by the town for the Dalrymple School and the Dalrymple Park. Herbert Hale must have been doing well financially as the trustee and manager of the Dalton and Hull Estate as he was able to build this house just out of town in 1905. The beginning of the end for the transfer came when the first automobile rolled into town in 1903. Due to a lack of business, the passenger and mail service between Bayfield and Redcliffe was suspended in 1913, and sawmills and the sawmills at Royce Point and Redcliffe were ceased, uh, ceased to operations that year. The Wattsmith Lumber Company, which had purchased Pike's Little Daisy, Daisy, Little Daisy Bell, took over the BH and GW Railway and ran the train as a private logging road until 1824. Ironically, the transfer became more profitable as a lumber company, something that Pike would probably have enjoyed. So, that completes my story about transfer, but I uh, have one question left. According to Dalrymple's diaries, he had at least one formal portrait taken, but I was never able to find a photograph of Dal 
a tolerable, or even a physical description of the man. One source described him as having, quote, a face such as artists like to paint, full of strength in his contour, with an eye like an eagle's, very quiet, but not much help. I did find this, this photograph in the BH archives. I'm sure you've seen it before. Eleanor Knight titled this photo as Bayfield's Early Movers and Shapers. The notation on the back states that the picture was taken between 1880 and 1900, and the men in the front row were identified as this gentleman over here, Clarence Le Moreau, on the left, who lived in Ashland, started in 1883. Yes. This man here, Samuel Fifield, in the middle, and of course, Curry Bell over here, who took over the Bayfield Press in 1882. The two men in the top and the back row, this man and this man, were not identified. I would like to suggest to you that the man on the top left, this man right here, is William Dalrymple. It's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> William had certainly been considered a, a, a Bayfield mover and shaker in the 1880s. And I think, well, let's try this. There he is, over here. That this man, that he bears a strong, strong resemblance to this older photo of William's brother Oliver. In his diaries, he wrote several times about buying hats, like the one the man is holding in his right hand, this one right here, top hat. <laughs> William would have been in his late 50s in, the 18, in 1883. Again, I know it's a stretch. Bear with me. I like it. I like it. If somebody else knows who that man is, don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> one final thought to take home with you. It's always fun to speculate about the what ifs. What if Dalrymple had gotten the financing he needed as early as 1885 or even 1892? What if he had reached an agreement with Pike in 1885 and avoided all the issues that Pike and Saban created? And what if he had been able to complete the BH and GW through the Iron River before the panic of 1893? Certainly, Mayfield would have been a more prosperous town during that period of time. Just look at the sawmills that developed in Redcliffe and Forest Point and the jobs and communities that were created once the transfer began to run. <coughs> but what would Bayfield look like today? Would we have a town of Tolerable on the west side of Highway 13? And what would that town look like? And would that the industry that Dalrymple envisioned along the shoreline from Bayfield to Redcliffe have left behind a post-industrial wasteland? You have to admire the man's integrity and tenacity, but I, for one, am pretty happy he did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much.